Okay. Smiling. Well, good morning. Shall we start with a prayer? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this and every day that you bless us to come together around your word. And as we uh, study some of the history of our church uh, and, and the uh, formation of the Augsburg Confession, we ask that you would fill our hearts with love for you and uh, your, your Holy Spirit to encourage us and, and move us forward. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so this here was just a little thing I found on the internet. It's, it's a really basic timeline of Martin Luther's life. So you can kind of see where he fits into this. But this is not really a study of Martin Luther because he wasn't at the Diet of Augsburg because if he were, he would have been arrested and hung. He was an outlaw. So this is after he separated? Pardon? This is after he separated? What do you mean by separated? Well, put the 95 thesis. Oh, yes, yes. That was, that was the, uh, so we'll, we'll get into that historical setting right right now. That's what we're going to do, yeah. They have a picture of him smiling at Well, that was the style then. That was to show your seriousness, yeah. I know, but yeah, right, right. No, he was known, in fact, for his humor. Really? His very body, bathroom humor, in fact, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, so as you can, uh, so Augsburg Confession is 1530, and as you look at this timeline of Luther, you can see where that fits in there. It's, uh, it's before he writes uh, Mighty Fortress, but after his time in the Wartburg Castle in 1521, uh, when uh, right after the uh, he was at, at the uh, uh, at the at, at Mainz where he had to recant he was, he was told to recant his faith and he said no this I cannot I cannot do I cannot do that it goes against my conscience it goes against the word of God and so uh, that was in Mainz it's uh, one of the few Catholic cathedrals where you will find a stained glass picture of Martin Luther because uh, that was the history of that parish, right? That 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 that, that, that uh, diet of worms was held there. I guess it was worms, not mites. It's up the river from from mites. But the diet of worms was where he was excommunicated and made an outlaw. And so his they have a picture of him in their stained glass there. All right. So this is fairly late in Luther's life as well. You see, he's dead by 1546, and all of this happens in 1530. So. What, you have two documents before you, the, the two staple packet, that is the actual text of the uh, Augsburg Confession as translated in 2000 in this version of the Book of Concord. Several of my professors were contributors to this. I don't have, the I don't have permission to copy though, so uh, we, this is for this study only. I don't want you to pass it on. I don't want you to sell it on eBay. <laughs> but, but anyway, this is, uh, so that's, that's what you have here, though, and it's uh, translated from the Latin. It was, it, was, it was written in both Latin and German, and so that's why this, this book of Concord <clears throat> is a little th thicker than maybe your Tappert version you had in Confirmation or something like that, because this one has the tr English translations of both Latin text and German text where they were provided. Sometimes things were only written in German, like things that Luther was writing to the people, and sometimes they were only written in the Latin, like when he was writing to the emperor or to the archbishop or the pope. All right. So that's the, the those were the two. Uh, so Latin was the, the the universal language back then. Right. If you wanted to converse in official documents, it was always done in Latin. If, uh, Luther was one of the first theologians to write in the language of the people. In fact, uh, one of the early English martyrs uh, was, uh, was killed because he dared to translate a Bible to English. And so he was, he was uh, put to death uh, for... I'm trying to. I, I'm trying, his name is slipping me. But it was okay. back in the. Uh, it was before the King James Bible, obviously, right? Because that was in English. Well, why was so, it such a sin to translate what's that? things in English? I was say Wycliffe or yeah, Wycliffe. That's it. 
So it was illegal to have. Yeah, it was illegal to have the Bible in any language but Latin in the Western Church. Okay. Of course, in the Eastern Church, all the Orthodox churches, it was in Greek, right? Which was the original text of the New Testament. It's lots of weird political reasons, but it came. It basically, what it came down to was. We all know Latin, so let's just stick with what we know. That's the overly simplified version, but anyway. So let's go to the thin packet, all right? This is what we'll be focused on today. It's important for us to get the historical setting to what is going on. What is prompting this document? You can go on liquid online, you know, read Wikipedia, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, and most of it's fairly accurate. You're going to see some discrepancies from one account to another. But I just, I've tried to put some things together here for you just to make it one-stop shopping. So, 1530, the height of the Protestant Reformation. And I say the height because Luther's still alive. Melanchthon, his number two, wrote most of the text of this. Um, Charles is still trying to keep uh, Roman Catholicism as the only religion in the, in the empire. Holy, this is the Holy Roman Empire, by the way, which curiously does not include Rome. All right. That's time I'm of Philip. Pardon? Oh, Philip Melanchthon. Melanchthon. Okay, so he and Martin Luther. He, he and Martin Luther both taught at Wittenberg. Okay. Yep. Philip Melanchthon wrote most of, or most of the uh, Augsburg Confession and its apology, which is a follow-up document after the Confutation, which was the Catholic's response to the, the uh, Augsburg Confession. Okay? Which raises so, another question. Why do they call it an apology? Why do you apologize? I know it doesn't need that, like normal words. Right. It's not, a, it's not, it's not, it's like not, I'm sorry. Like today we have apologies. Right. It, it's, it goes back to the Latin. It's a response. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's to make right what you misunderstood. Yes. Yes, it's a clarification. Apologist, yeah, yeah. More like, excuse me, you Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good, good, good questions. All right, so, uh, so I guess it's, it's the height of the Reformation, but we still just have one church. We're still Roman Catholics. All of them, all of the men who signed on to this and all of the cities who signed on to this confession would say, we are Roman Catholics. We just think that we need to fix some things. Okay? So, it's 1530. It's the height of the Reformation in that everybody's still talking to one another. This is before the Thirty Years' War. This is before people have started dying in mass because of the faith of the discrep discrepancies in the faith. Uh, there are several signatories on this document, which include princes, dukes, city, and, si and two city councils, representing a broad cross-section of the northeastern territories of the Holy Roman Empire. So this is basically from the Baltic Sea down into Saxony. If you know where Leipzig is, Leipzig was kind of the southernmost uh, territory of that. Uh, so right above Czechoslovakia and, and Austria, right? So what, basically what we knew during the Cold War as East Germany, those were the Protestant states. And we'll, we'll have a map later on that kind of illustrate that. Also, it had also uh, really spread to Scandinavia. And, this, and the, 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 thing, the reason why it spread so much quicker in Scandinavia was because they got to the king first. And we'll talk about that, why that's important. Okay. So everybody's trying to keep the peace. Here's the other interesting thing. In this day and age, the church and the state were separate but commingled. All right. Whatever religion the king held, all of his subjects were assumed to hold it as well. Some kings enforced that. Some kings did not. 
And so like in England, you know, where you go from Catholic to Protestant, back to Catholic, back to Protestant, and everybody's trying to vie for political power and all these people trying to knock off the kings and the queens, there was a lot of people who died simply because they were either Protestant or Catholic on both sides. And the same thing happened in Germany and, 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 uh, and Bohemia, Moravia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for the next, well, really up until 1600. So this was killing because of the war? Yes. 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 Yep, and since Luther was a you know prominent spokesperson for this particular strain of Christianity, he was quote unquote dangerous, right? So that's why he was not only ex, ex, uh, excommunicated, but he was declared an outlaw. And uh, Frederick the Wise had to beg Charles to give him a head start after the Diet at Worms, so that he wouldn't be killed right there and then in Worms. He said, ah, come on, you, you, you brought him here say, under peaceful terms to make him think that you were willing to listen to him, and now it's, it's, you can't, you can't uh, pull the rug out from him like that. Give him time to get back to where his people can look out after him. And, and Charles relented and said, well, okay. Ready, set, go. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, he was captured, quote, unquote, and taken to uh, uh, Eisenach, where he stayed in the Wartburg Castle, and as Junker George, Knight George, grew a beard, grew out his hair, and translated the Old Testament, or the New Testament. I forget which word. I think it was the uh, New Testament. All right, so we've got, uh, as I said, primarily Philip Melanchthon, but if you do some reading on this, especially the preface in the, on, our, on our packet, you'll see where a lot of this material was buried, uh, borrowed from previous treaty treaties and other agreements like the small caldic league the what small Ca the small caldic league that? Yeah, that was another group of princes that came together for common defense and they did so around their common faith and so there were some articles of faith that were drawn up which said okay if if charles comes after you i'm going to protect you because i believe the same thing okay so it was a defensive, it was to define their beliefs for defensive reasons, whereas the Augsburg Confession was always meant to be a reconciliatory document. It was intended to bring the church together, to bring the people together. Uh, the whole idea being to legalize Lutheran teaching and practice within certain German lands. And it was held in Augsburg, Austria, in the Holy Roman Empire, which for a lot of the later part of the Holy Roman Empire, was one of the capitals, Innsbruck and, not Augsburg, uh, not Augsburg, uh, Innsbruck and Vienna, excuse me, but Augsburg is close by, right? It's a small country. So even though Charles, also known as Carlos of Spain, he was, yeah, we'll get into that too. He was Spanish. He was Charles grandson of Isabella and Ferdinand. This is Charles V. Charles V. It was also Carlos of Spain. Carlos of Spain, right. And so uh, he's the one they're trying to impress. All right. So, somebody want to read that first paragraph? Yeah, go, I'm sorry, go, questions, yeah. What was going on in um, the Holy, I mean, in the Pope and all that? Because you said that they weren't part of the whole Holy Roman Empire at this time. So right. So what was going on with that? They were a different power. The papal states. Okay. The Pope had his own armies and had his own. And who was the Pope at the time? Uh, Clement the Seventh. What's that? Clement the Seventh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank you. He doesn't play really into this whole thing. Uh, he he sent. This was just a minor scrabble among the Germans. He sent his Archbishop to take care of these things. Yep. Okay. So would somebody read the first paragraph there. Oh, in the small packet. The small packet. Yeah, yeah. I'll read it. In the place where people's religion followed the king's religion, it would be normally be understood that all of Charles V's subjects would be Roman Catholic. That is, was his devout religion. Not only other possibilities in Europe at the time would be Eastern Orthodox, Russian and Slavic kings, or I'll 
Islam. 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 Ottoman Empire. Okay. So, those are the three great powers. Uh, you have the Slavic lands, you have the Roman lands, and you have the Ottomans, which were Turkey, but then wrapping around South Africa, and you know, for a time they were even big in Spain, right? The Alhambra, if you've ever been there. So, and, and Ottoman Empire is knocking at Vienna's door. They sieged Vienna towards before they finally backed off. It was, that's how close to Europe the Ottomans got. All right. So, however, the Holy Roman Empire was not your typical kingdom. It was not ruled absolutely by the king, by divine, by the divine right of kings, whereby the king's firstborn son was assumed to become the next king. Rather, from the 13th century, the Holy Roman Empire selected its emperor via an election held among seven noblemen. All right. Four were secular princes and three were, quote, princes of the church, end of quote. That is, archbishops serving within the empire as city cathedrals. In essence, the empire was a confederation of many dukedoms, kingdoms, principalities, and free city-states, along with the Roman Catholic Church. And you can see that patchwork quilt if you turn the page, that top map right there. All those different colors represent a different type of, of kingdom or dukedom, etc. The biggest one, interesting, being the kingdom of uh, Bohemia, which held a lot of power for several generations. But you see there, it's just a mess, right? So that was the Holy Roman Empire. And you see there, it stretches to northern Italy, but not across the whole peninsula, just on the western half for the most part. Venice was still a powerful uh, nation uh, because of sea trade. So Vienna, or not Vienna, Venice still had uh, power in some lands. And, uh, and France was an independent kingdom, also loyal to the Pope. And as I said, uh, uh, oh, also you'll see up there in the northwest corner, he started out as a prince of the Netherlands. That's where he was born, Charles was. So he was king of the Netherlands, the Holy Roman Empire, and Spain. To me, I mean, we live in an age of digital. All these different regions, all these different areas, how do they get things done? Right. They send squires with pieces of paper. Right. And so here's where the, the electors come in handy. The question was, how did he get anything done with all of this myriad of, right. of governance? The electors also then had a responsibility to keep the other kings and princes and dukes in line. Okay? They would go to war. Okay? So there might be a little skirmish within the empire that, that didn't concern the king because it was Albrecht of Mainz keeping, you know, the Westphalians in, in check. Now, Albrecht of Mainz was an archbishop. He had an army because he was one of the electors. But, I mean, this takes time. Oh, yes, yes. And in, in fact, uh, Charles didn't have a set capital because he also had to make appearances to different places too to assert his kingship, right? And so he would take, he was constantly on the road and going to various, you know, kind of a slow roll around the, around the kingdoms. He didn't make it to, to, to America, even though he controlled about a third of it at the time. But he set up all kinds of, he made sure that government was set up, et cetera, et cetera. He was a very, he was, he was probably one of the more efficient of the kings, primarily because of his restraint. From? From, from violence. Oh. He I did was just not, yeah. say that during this time, it was a lot of fighting. And Tons, all, yes, yes. And he was trying to keep the peace. And right. Remember at this time, too, one-fourth of all the adult population were either nuns or monks because that was one way you could ensure three squares and a bed. Not only did they have to deal with all this, but then there was drought, famine. Plague, yeah. It was a horrible time to live. All right. So the emperor only had power so long as he held the confidence of the seven electors and the pope. The electors were the Archbishop of Mainz, the Archbishop of Trier, 
Archbishop of Cologne, King of Bohemia, Count Palatine of the Rhine, the Duke of Saxony, and the Margrave of Brandenburg, which is the area from Berlin and northward. All right. Upon the emperor's death, the Archbishop of Mainz would summon the other electors to an election within one month of the king's death to be convened within three months. All right. After this election, the new emperor will be crowned by the pope in Rome at some point. So All for right. a whole third of a year, there was no... There was a regency that was oh. arranged, yes. Okay. So yes, yeah, so the Archbishop of Mainz would arrange for competent, capable people okay. to run the empire until the electors could uh, vote in a new uh, elector. Okay. So this is the... Uh, it's, it, uh, Charles is really the beginning kind of of the Habsburg line, if you know the name of the Habsburgs, right? So the Habsburgs of Austria really became the dominant uh, rulers after that. And unless you, they saw a real problem with the king's son, they would often elect the king's son. Okay? So it was like that, you know, like a traditional kingdom, but you had to prove yourself to so at least these seven guys. All right. After several decades of his teaching and publishing this new Protestant theology, several of the nobles were persuaded that Luther's understanding of Scripture was correct and desired the emperor's protection under the law to believe in such teachings and declare them to be faithful to the church. Remember this law of kings thing, right? If you are the king of Bohemia, are you going to take, are you going to stand that? The king of the Roman Empire is going to tell you how religion your people are going to have? No, you're a king too. This is a confederation. This wasn't an absolute kingdom. So the king of Prussia, or the king of, uh, of, of uh, Bohemia, and the Margrave of Brandenburg are going to say, uh, Charles, you don't get a say of how we're going to do the mass in our churches. That's my job. I'm the king of this here land. So you have a real, you know. Uh, power struggle, you know, meeting of the bulls, if you will, to see who's going to be dominant. So where is Martin Luther? He's in safe territory. Okay. But he's not part of any He's of not a part of this, no. Of they're, they're, they're sending runners back and forth to him to keep him apprised. He's totally placed this into Phil Melanchthon's hands because he's much more politically savvy. Luther's a hothead. Luther has a temper. Luther is not a diplomat. Oh yes, oh yes, and he was ruthless when he did. But this, uh, the other thing is a diet, or diet. They would last for weeks, maybe months, and you know, and because you know, once you call the diet, it might take you know people from different lengths of distance longer to get there than you, and so you just you, you would rent a house, you'd set up court there in Augsburg and so you, you know what it's like when uh, you know the president or the vice president comes to town and I-10 is shut down and how much traffic is snarled etc etc now imagine there's 20 or 30 princes in town and they all have their retinue and their guards and their you know all this security and how much of a, 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 a inconvenience it might have been but at the same time it was a boon to the local businesses right feed all these extra people, etc. All right. So the Augsburg Confession and the resulting peace of Augsburg in 1555, after the small Calden Wars, would mean that Protestantism would be tolerated within the empire. Charles V was thus the last emperor to receive the honor of coronation by the Pope because the empire was no, no longer wholly Roman Catholic. Succeeding emperors were known simply as elected emperor of the Romans, even though he ruled no Romans. <laughs> All right. So this was important to, this is why it was so important to Charles, to keep everybody Catholic. He didn't want a split. He wanted reconciliation. But as we saw there, the 1530, they didn't get it after the Augsburg Confession. They went to war, the small Caldic Wars. And it wasn't until they had the peace treaty in 15. 55 that, that he decided, okay, we're going to be 
we're going to be one state, two religions. Okay? And actually it was three religions because they also had some folks who were uh, Calvinists. Okay? So if you look back on your map page, the second page, this is the second map, the blue are the Calvinist areas. And so the ones way off east, that's where your Mennonites and your Amish come from. A lot of them. As well as the ones in Germany and Switzerland. Switzerland is a big, uh, a big group of, uh, of Mennonites came from Switzerland. I think, I think Menno actually came from Switzerland, if I, if I, if I recall. Uh, the yellow was Lutheran. And, and then you see all those red dots. It says Huguenot centers. What's, anybody know what a Huguenot is? A French Protestant, right. French Protestant? Yes. French was vehemently Catholic, but uh, there were Protestant churches that formed, and they were tolerated. That was it. Usually persecuted. Okay? So... That's why they're just little dots, because they're just kind of scattered here and there. All right. Interestingly enough, if you go to Berlin, you, on, if you go on the tour around the city, they'll point out to you the Catholic Church. <laughs> because the Catholic Church wasn't permitted there until a certain point after the Reformation, and they have one parish. Well, now they have many. But, but back in the, you know, the the 16th century and the 17th century, you had to go to that parish and, and you had to get permission to go there as well. You had to prove that either ethnically or, or uh, familiarly you had ties back to the Catholic Church in some way. You couldn't just decide to be Catholic because you were German. And if you were German, you were Protestant. In the north, in the Margrave of Pomerania, or Brandenburg, excuse me, Brandenburg, but if you were in Munich, you were Catholic. Southern again, different kings, different princes, different lands, and so that's why you had this patchwork quilt of purple, or excuse me, of yellow, green, and blue. All right. And even to this day, well, just fast forward, a German Kaiser, a Lutheran Kaiser gets uh, engaged to a Calvinist princess, and guess what? Neither one of them wanted to budge. So this was in the 1820s. Usually the male and, Well, and so, well, in this case, he said, you know, happy wife, happy life. And we're going to say, oh, they're all basically the same. So. And so now in Germany, it's no longer Lutheran and Calvinist and Catholic. It's now Catholic and Evangelical. And evangelical, you might have a Calvinist preacher that won't baptize babies, or you might have a Lutheran preacher that does baptize babies. You might have a Calvinist preacher that says, oh, Jesus is just represented in the sacrament, or you might have a Lutheran pastor who says, oh, no, the body and blood of Jesus is here. Pastor, yeah. I've been reading all of Ken Follett's books, and it back then it was very important that you stayed with Right. Because it would be like, no, you can't mix with us. Right. So we don't understand that. But right. back then it was more of a to do. So this union of the two churches, like you said, it was just groundbreaking. No one's done this before. It became known as the Prussian Union. And this is what spurred the Saxons with their five ships to come to New Orleans and then up the river to St. Louis and start the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in 1838. Okay? So all this ties to us directly. One of the five ships never arrived. What happened? We don't know. It sunk. And it had the organ. <laughs> <laughs> you think maybe God was telling us something? <laughs> you don't need an organ. <laughs> the organ. The organ. <laughs> Because they were going to they were going to form a commune. Calliope. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, 
Okay, so 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 that, so all this ties together, right? The the need primarily by these Saxons and, and North North Germans, the need to have a right understanding, primarily of word and sacrament, but also in the elements of of, of you know the, the solas, right? Sola fide, sola gratia. So you know, faith, by faith alone, by grace alone, by faith alone, uh, through Christ alone, the Word alone, Scripture alone. Right? Sola Scriptura, sola fide. Anyway, you get the idea. This idea of keeping the faith correct started a long time ago for, for, for very good reasons. And so, and the Catholics were just as adamant in their understanding. Let me let me get that across too. They are no less adamant than Luther and Melanchthon and the, and the Protestants. That's why this was so difficult. But there's one big difference between the Lutherans, if you will, the Protestants, and the Catholics. The Catholics had an extra source of authority. What is our authority? God, so if God spoke to us directly, we would call that authoritative. What else? Scripture. scripture. And we say sola scriptura, meaning scripture alone. Only scripture. Scripture is the only authority for us. Well, the Roman Catholic Church has three authorities. Scripture, the Pope, ex cathedra, or not, not ex, that would be out of the chair. When he's in, a, when he's in the chair. <laughs> Pope, when he's sitting in his throne, on the throne. And tradition. The thought being there, if the church carries on a bad practice long enough and God doesn't stop it, God must be okay with it. <laughs> and this is why in the Roman Catholic Church, Mary was the, is a perpetual virgin. Jesus didn't have brothers and sisters. You know, Mary was assumed into heaven. Mary was an immaculate conception. Even Mary didn't have a, an earthly father. These are all Roman Catholic teachings that persist because tradition says it. Okay? I grew up in a Catholic church. Well, yeah, they're, they're minor points. But they're, but they're there. Yeah. And in fact, she was named by one of the more recent popes as co-redemptrix. Mary. Yes, what does that mean? What did she say? She was named co-redemptrix. She can save you apart from Jesus. They, they pray the saints too, Pastor. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they have all these saints and you have right, your right. own. So it, I mean, right, so, so yeah, so, yeah. So this is why. Like I said, they're very genuine in their belief. Charles is not just trying to strong arm things. He believes all of this. And he believes that his Pope is his spiritual guide. And he wants to please the Pope, the Holy Father. Right? And so, and, but yet Luther and the Reformers are like, we love the church. You know, we grew up in the church. This church is awesome. But it's wrong. We need to fix it. Because of Romans. Because of Galatians, etc. Couldn't the Pope's marry? Or, I mean, not marry, but. He could before 1050 or something yeah, like I that. Mean, they had affairs or out of wedlock. Oh, all it, the time, was, right, right. They had yeah. affairs. Yeah. Yeah. Luther, that was, yeah. when Luther went to Rome, he was very scandalized because they actually had separate brothels just for the priests and the monks so that they wouldn't have to uh, go. <laughs> Tramping around with the commoners. The Warsha family, Alexander's kids. We don't need the history of all that. There's a lot of interesting stuff there, but I'm going to avoid that. But, but the point, but, but yes, the, but, you know, the side note, yes, the Catholic priests were married up to a point, and then they said no more, and now there's a movement to maybe, like right now, if I decided I don't want to be Lutheran anymore, I want to be Catholic, the Catholic Church says, sure, we'll take you and Susan, but she has to know she's second to God in the church. Or not second to God anyway. <laughs> anyway, it's, but yes, any, any married man can join the priesthood, even today. 
Even a Catholic, although they'll dissuade you from it, they'll say, why don't you go on the deacon vote instead, you know, things like that. But it's not 100% forbidden, it's just preferred. Anyway, so we've looked at those two maps. Let's go to page three. Now we're going to look specifically at Charles, a.k.a. Carlos I of Spain, Charles II, Lord of the Netherlands and Duke of Burgundy, Charles I, Archduke of Austria. Those are the kingdoms he ruled simultaneously. So that's one, two, three, four. And you'll see that map below there. You can see all the European lands he ruled because he also had Naples and Sicily through his uh, Burgundian uh, links, I think. And then he also then had a big chunk of Central and South America. All right. So the Holy Roman Empire was founded on Christmas Day 800 when the Pope crowned Charlemagne as the Holy Roman Empire Emperor. Pope Leo III did that. It was dissolved in 1806 with the abdication of Francis II, one month after Napoleon formed the Confederation of the Rhine, made up of many of the former German states that were within the Holy Roman Empire. So it lasted for a thousand years. Pretty impressive, right? Capitals uh, later were Innsbruck, Vienna, and during Charles V's reign, he kind of traveled between his three kingdoms. So there was no real capital, but Austria was the political center of the empire. It's where a lot of the records were kept, etc. Charles V, grandson of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain and Aragon, and Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian, head of the Habsburg family, and Mary of Burgundy. He was born in Ghent but raised in Spain. He became heir to both thrones when the Spanish heir died and upon Maximilian's death. So it skipped a whole generation because he was just the next male heir. Charles ruled nearly all of continental Europe except for France and some of, uh, and some of the Italian peninsula as well, as well as Central America and large swaths of South America. Well, he never made the trip. Um, we talked about that. Interestingly, Rome was not under his rule, even though he was crowned by Clement, Pope Clement VII in Bologna, 10 years after he was elected and seated on the throne in Germany. Again, this was, it was important to Charles, but it had to be done at the right time. When it was politically expedient and important to do so. And Bologna was in Charles' territory, not Clement's territory. So that, that was, had some interesting political uh, ramifications as well. When did Charles die? Uh, 55. He died at 55? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Right at the same time as the, right after he signed the Peace of Westphalia, or a piece of, uh, the Peace of Augsburg. All I believe. I, I have to go back and double check that. Just, it, was that it, was that, it was that same time frame, yeah. I was just trying to think where all this was in terms of, you know, the English sinking the Spanish Armada in 1588. Oh, okay. And Spain exactly. lost this everything. Before this is before that, that, right. But about 30 years. Not, not a long time ago. Things are done the boards. Right. Right, Henry VIII. That's I was, Henry yeah, thank VIII. you. I was gonna say this is also going on at the same time. Henry VIII, defender of the faith, was what he was known as originally, because as Luther was becoming popular, Luther said, or Henry said, he didn't like this. He said, "This is you know, he's 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 bad mouth in the church. We love the church." So he decides to write. He, Henry was actually pretty intelligent. He wrote a well-received uh, essay. I can't remember what it's called, but anyway, that's what you're in the title, Defender of the Faith. Well, then he marries Anne Boleyn, who is Lutheran. Mary? No, no. He's, he's married one. to Catherine. He's married Catherine to Catherine. Is Catherine, Catherine is Catherine. Charles's aunt. Yes, he's Charles's aunt. Right, right. So that's the other thing. He is, she is Charles's aunt. Catherine of Aragon. Catherine of Aragon. Right? So Charles was born in the, in the Aragon family. And he wanted to divorce her, but the Pope wouldn't let him. So he forms his own church well, and becomes the head of the church. For the same time, Anne Boleyn has Lutheran leanings and is bringing those ideas to him. And it's convenient, as you said, because if he can say, well, we're no longer Catholic, we want to be Protestant, and so I'm the head of the, the Protestant church in England. He wants to get rid of the Pope. 
He wants to get rid of the Pope's power over him. Right. He wants to be yeah, the he only wants king. The only power right. to be his own. Right. He doesn't care if the, if the Roman Catholic So to is. this day, the Church of England and the Anglican Communion, which includes the Episcopal Church, and the Lutherans are the only two church bodies that have uh, co substantiation as their doctrine for Holy Communion. Wait, say that again? The Anglicans, the, the English, and the, the Germans, basically, the, the Lutherans, are the, is the, are the only two church bodies that have co-substantiation as their understanding for Holy Communion, which means, okay, in the Catholic Church, it's transubstantiation, right? The bread and the wine become solely body and blood. Reformed says, no, we can see it's still bread and wine, but we believe that somehow Christ mystically gives us his presence. We don't know what it is, but it's certainly not body and blood. The Lutherans and the Anglicans say, <clears throat> well, no. Jesus said, or Jesus said, this is my body, so we take him at his word. But we can also clearly taste the wine and, and feel the bread, so we know it's also bread and wine. So we're going to say it's both bread and wine and body and blood. And then Luther's, the Lutherans added this in, with, and under phrase, which just confuses everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one contrib contribution of the of Luther to to uh, Henry VIII's new church. Yeah. I like it to Jesus on the cross and you and your cup. Yeah. Two in one. Right. Right. Same thing with the body. Sure. So if Jesus can be human and God, why can't communion be bread and body? Right. Okay. Good. Good. I like that. Yeah. Okay. So yes, so we, we've got the English Revolution or the English Reformation going on at the same time as the as the uh, Lutheran Reformation, as well as the Calvinist Reformation. And what's that? So John Calvin was their was their leader. He was their primary teacher and influencer. He was in Geneva, Switzerland. Okay. And so he influenced, uh, he, he said, he was one that said, you know, adult baptism, no infant baptism. As did Menno and the Mennonites, they were both Anabaptists and, uh, and Zwingli. Uh, he so He also believed in predestination. Right, so Calvin had the double predestination. Not only does God know who's going to be saved, but he determines who's going to be saved. So if you're one of the elect, good for you. If you're not, that's too bad. That's too bad. <laughs> so you can do whatever you want. And so, and so, the, the, so that's the Presbyterian view, right? Uh, Baptists don't have that. They didn't adopt that side of it. So, so Calvinists are uh, primarily Presbyterian. And so Scotland really uh, embraced that. So you see Scotland. Also Korea. South Korea is almost entirely Presbyterian. Because the missionaries, right, right, yep. And it's interesting because, you know, South Korea and Japan are not that far apart. They're both honor-based cultures, and yet Japan never did have a great, vast missionary movement. There were always missionaries there, but they never were able to get a foothold for some reason. Uh, the Japanese natural religion just persists even to this day, which is really interesting. What is their religion? It's called Shinto. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a combination of ancestor worship and nature. If you respect your ancestors and you're praying to them, you be your intermediaries, but you that's the whole thing of you clap and bow because you're trying to wake up your ancestors. And it's, um, it's well, there are a lot of Buddhists. Um, can have a Buddhist temple, but it might not be Buddhist. Buddhist? It may say Buddhist, but it's both. <laughs> or you can have just Shinto. Shinto can be little shrines in the woods. I mean, they're not all temples. Right. You can just go into a spot in the woods and there'll be a little prayer station and you can okay. you write your stuff on little wood boards. And <clears throat> very cool. I mean, it's cool to watch because they are very respectful. And there's an actual process to it, and it's. I thought it was kind of moving. Okay. But it's not much but, different but, than what we do in terms of, you know, how often you say, "Hey, Grandma, take care of Grandpa." 
he's on his way. But it has nothing to do with the Augsburg Confession, so we're going to go back to that. <laughs> interesting, Bill, Susan. Interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> and if you are interested in that, give Susan a ring, and she will put together a PowerPoint and bring... No, no I'm serious. If you want her to do a presentation on Japan, she has all the stuff, and she can, she can give you a nice talk on Japan, culture, and everything. All right. So let's go to the big packet. That was actually interesting. So not all of this is the Augsburg Confession. You'll see starting on, uh, I've got pages four and five. Actually, pages two and three. This is the editors, that is the guys that I took class from. Their preface to the Augsburg Confession. You couldn't have waited to do this until August until the new version came out with the third guy? Oh, Glenn's already got it. So this is four dollars at CPH. Is that what you said? Four dollars. No, Amazon. there's a new one Amazon that's coming out in August from Kolb and, and Winger. Oh, really? Yeah, it, it says publication date August okay. twenty uh, Bob Kolb is a saint, living saint. He was one of my professors and one of my bosses when I worked on campus. Yeah, Robert Kolb. He uh, he refers to Luther as my friend Martin. <laughs> he really does feel like he knows Martin yeah. Luther on a personal yeah. basis. He spends six months of the year in Germany, writing in German for the German universities and seminaries. And then he spent six months of the year in St. Louis, where we got to gain from his wisdom. Just a gentle soul with this, with this wicked, sharp, dry sense of humor. <laughs> You had to pay attention or you didn't know you were insulted. <laughs> That's great. He was he was great. He was wonderful. And and really had the, but he had the he he wasn't a, a lofty, you know, smarty right. pants professor. He was there on campus because he wanted us to become good pastors by knowing our history and by knowing the the reasons for our faith. And uh, Grew up in Fort Dodge, Iowa. If you, you ever heard somebody from Fort Dodge? I have a very good friend from Fort Dodge, Cheryl Heckman. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and they never pronounced the T. Yeah, and her father is Fort Dodge. Fort Dodge. Fort Dodge. Her father was a Lutheran minister there. Right? Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so that, <clears throat> there's some good history in there, some of which I gleaned from my conversation earlier, but you can find the more details there. Uh, it says uh, over on the top of page three, Melanchthon recognized that Lutherans, oh yeah, here, this is, is important. After Luther had been outlawed in 1521, the Catholics knew they had to do a better job of being on the offense, of promoting Catholicism, especially in these German lands. And so, but they started doing it in kind of a nasty way. They would take, they would go out and they'd keep their ear to the ground and find out what kinds of wackadoodle things people were saying. Because when Luther started speaking freely, a lot of people all of a sudden felt the urge, well, if Luther can say what he believes, I can say what I believe. And boy, you ask people what they think, they're going to tell you. And some of it is really out there. And so, uh, so the, 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 the cardinal that was going to be leading the, the Augsburg group from Rome, he had recently published 400 statements of the reformers and why they should be condemned. And he included Luther's statements in amongst all these crazy things. And I mean really crazy, like there's only two persons of the Trinity. What? Right, well they wouldn't, they wouldn't call it the Trinity anymore. They would say that it's not a Trinity, it's a duality. The Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit is is just kind of kind of commingled in with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this is one of the heresies that then Luther was lumped in with. And so, so Melanchthon then said, well, we got to take a different attack on this. So that, he says, uh, we'd have to do more than address the issues of reform. They would also have to demonstrate their orthodoxy and their Catholicity. Therefore, he construed a confession, changing its name from apologia, defense, of 21 articles on doctrinal topics and seven articles on reform efforts. In doing so, he sought to show that the theology taught in Wittenberg remained true to the Catholic tradition, both by stating the biblical truth 
and by condemning the false teachings also rejected by Roman Catholic opponents. It's like if you pull out People magazine and they show a picture of some glamorous star washing their car and they say, see, they're just like us. All right, right. Well, this is what Melanchthon said. We need to show them that we're Catholic too. We're not rebels. We're trying to help the church. And so that's the approach then that these uh, articles take. Now, if you turn to page four, this is where you get the preface and uh, by the, uh, the guys who signed it at the very end. You'll see their names listed on the last page. <clears throat> okay, have, so instead yeah, yeah. of calling it an apologia, he decided to call it a confession. Confessio, right. So he's not attacking the 400 things. He's not defending. defending. He's just saying. He's confessing he the is, Catholic faith. He's on the offense. Yep. Okay. We're, well, well he's, he's saying, we're with you, Cardinal. Yeah. We're with you, Charles. We're with you, Clement. Gotcha. Yeah. So, and as you read this, you'll see it's it's very fancy language, very humble, stating you know, that, you know we're your faithful subjects, Charles, but also being very firm. We believe these truths to be self-evident. No, that's 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 later. Uh, but uh, you know, they're, they're, you know the thing, you know the thing, right, right, right. You know the thing. <laughs> So again, this is from the Latin text. It was presented in German first to be circulated because all the attendees were going to be German, including the Pope's representatives, except for Charles. He spoke German, or he understood German, but he wasn't comfortable with it. He was comfortable in Portuguese, French, Dutch, French, and Latin, and Spanish. He could understand. Well, because he, he, he grew up in the Netherlands, he knew Dutch, and Dutch is so similar to German. It sounds a lot alike. That's the, that's the confusing part between Dutch and German. They sound so similar, but they're two different languages, and so you can make some wrong assumptions if you're learning one or the other. It's really good. Like, it's like, I want to digress. It's and, and yeah. German, so it's like a mix of the two. It's a mix of the two, yeah, yeah. I, I want to digress just a bit. Yes. How did the Netherlands end up to be um, Calvinist? If he was born and raised there and everything, how did he right. control because that? Because their preachers were fans of Calvin. Okay, well, that they're, they're sense, bishops, they're, they're, they're just pastors. Seems yeah. It's odd that he lost the Netherlands, if that's where he came from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so the confession of faith presented to the invincible emperor, Charles V, Caesar Augustus. See, they even try to keep that old Roman insignia, right? In fact, they claim to be the faithful heirs to the ancient Roman Empire, which dissolved in 430, whatever it was, 400 something. They claim to be the Roman Empire restored with Charlemagne in the city of Augsburg, year 1530. And then they give that Psalm 119, I will also speak of your decrees before kings and shall not be put to shame. So there is a case of using the Bible as a weapon. You're the king but I've got the word of God on my side. Huh? How about that? I'm not going to like that. But he can't refute it. Him being a faithful Catholic, he has to humbly submit to the word of God. And the, and, and the princes know it. Okay. <clears throat> so if you see in the middle of that first paragraph, he says, in this way, by correcting whatever has been treated differently in the writings of both parties, Everything could be brought together and returned to one single truth and to Christian conquered. Moreover, we may thus honor and serve one pure and true religion, for just as we exist and fight under one Christ, so may we also be able to live in one Christian church in unity and concord. All right? And that's why this book is called the Book of Concord. This defines our unity in the faith. As Lutherans. Okay. So, now we're just going to kind of take a quick peruse through the, because we don't have time to get into any of them. But I want you to look here. And he said there was 21 and 7. And so as you look through these articles, you'll see some are quite short. And then you get into some long ones, like 20, concerning faith and good works. Why do you suppose this would be an important article that the, that the Lutherans would want to talk about? 
Okay. That yeah. was and you can't be saved by good works. Okay. Yeah. What happened in 1517 on October 31st? The 95, 95 Theses. 95 Theses against? Catholic, Catholic churches. Indulgences. 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 Oh. It was specifically yeah. indulgences, indulgences only. Yeah. That's, that was Luther's big concern, that, that good works had been elevated above faith in, in the act of saving people. And so naturally, this is a big point of contention with the Lutheran princes. And so that's where they spent a lot of time. And then... Page 13, you start seeing there then with uh, Article 22. This is where they wanted to reform uh, practice. Okay. So practices in the church that they thought should be uh, um, fixed. And it has a lot to do with the Mass, obviously. And uh, all these things, things that are, well, we might say adiaphora, but they really weren't. They were important. They were, they were ways in which the church was wielding power over the people through their practice. And, and, the, and, and the Lutherans said, the church shall not be a tyrant. Yes, yeah, that was long practice. Time. Long time practice. And the reason being, oh, so the practice was, uh, uh, the Lutherans said, the people should receive the wine as well as the bread. Because they weren't receiving the wine. And the reason was, what if they spill it? What if it drips out of their mouth and hits the floor? If Luther spilled wine when he was conducting the Mass amongst the priests, and one of them spilled wine, he would literally get on the floor and lick it up so that it would not be disrespectful to God to have his blood just be trampled over at the altar. That's all clumsy. <laughs> But that's why we and that's why the priest would always drink that last of the cup rather than... And don't we pour ours down into the earth? Into the earth. It does not go into the sewer. That no. drain goes right, right out to the, the dirt earth. patch yes. beside the church. Exactly. Yes, that Vatican II. Right. 1966. It still does in most masses, right? What's that? It still does in most masses. It's, it's dependent on the church, but it is, it is now allowed for the laity to receive it yeah. if the parish decides to. Like sometimes at high mass at a wedding, they'll give yes. the wedding party the wedding all party, in, yeah. but right. everybody else who comes up it. still just gets the, the, the wafer. Right. 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 <laughs> and there's nothing so, nastier than watching the Catholic priest eat and drink what's left because it can be quite a bit. And they're this bush in a cup, and it's like, Ugh. Well, I've never heard of that. I just heard that they drank all the wine. It can get pretty foamy at the bottom. In my hometown, by noon, they had like five services, and by noon, you would be, was a little... How many of you guys have helped serve Common Cup? There's a lot of spittle that goes back in. That's why the That's cup why is lined with silver. <laughs> it doesn't, it, 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 yeah, it doesn't do it. It doesn't kill the germs. Well, if they ever kill it. They ever clear it does. You wipe the liver. That's, your, that's what you're supposed to have the purificator yeah, yeah. soaked in Everclear. And that. Yeah. Yeah. Green alcohol. So. So. Let's. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to wrap up here, but I just want to encourage you to maybe read these prefaces. Or if you don't think you'll remember to bring it back, just leave them here and we'll pick them up. But uh, you can go online and you can read the, uh, all of it except for the, the editor's stuff, the editor's notes from this edition. But there are online, free online versions. The Taproot version, I think, is widely available for free. Um, I know that the, uh, the, book, the, the Triglot, Tri Triglata from 1905, which was German, Latin, English, is free. There's a PDF, several PDFs online. And, uh, and there you can see how the translations differ between Latin, German, English. Uh, so um, anyway, you can go online and pull it up anywhere. But let's try to maybe look next time at just the first couple and uh, see how far we get. But, those, those are real basic things concerning God, concerning uh, sin, and concerning the Son of God. Those really are some essential basics that the Reformers wanted to let the Pope know we have not departed from the faith. Because these are essential to understanding our faith. And Luther didn't even sign it. No. 
No, it would no. He didn't. He had no power. He was just a professor at Wittenberg. He was the idea guy, but he had no political power. He had no such thing as an amicus brief. And and he was never. Yeah, he never got his law degree that I recall. He'd studied law, but he didn't get a law degree. I don't believe. But uh, but I may be wrong on that. But yeah, you'll see there that those are all the the rulers that and the, the Senate at Rutlingen. You know, that was one of the cities that. Mm -hmm. That joined um, city and mayor of Nuremberg again another Saxon Thuringian I'd say that area is kind of Thuringia and Saxony it's all kind of mishmashed together all right this is a lot of stuff it's oh it's it's a lot of stuff this yes yes stuff. do not do not let yourself be overwhelmed <laughs> all right okay I just was. don't worry about it. But let you know if it just let it pick your interest where it will, right? You do not have to be a historian to be a Lutheran. But Lutherans have a lot of history. All right. Okay, let's pray, shall we? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. One more comment before we go. I pointed this out. This version can be real, a real nice. Uh, it's uh, like, it, like I said, it's inexpensive. It gives some extra little notes and, and features. Uh, it came about because, well, that's CPH. This version here, was published by Fortress Press, which is the ELCA publishing house. But Fortress and CPH go back, way back to the 50s, when they co-published the works of Martin Luther. All right, so Luther's works, half of them were published by CPH, half by, yeah, so this is, this is the one that's most recently published by CPH. And, uh, and so they can publish it and not have to pay royalties and copyrights and things like that that are involved here. It is not a denunciation of this. This is the scholarly version. The blue one is the scholarly version. That's what they call the people's commentary or something like that. Reader's edition, yeah. Pastor, yeah. this was very good, by the way. 